Hello everyone, my name is Sergey. I am a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg and I study blockchains. This is an introductory talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Actually, it's not the first time I'm giving this talk. I already presented the earlier versions of these slides in Russian in 2014 and then later in 2016. But now, in December 2017, due to the incredible interest in cryptocurrencies, I decided to record this talk fully in English and I hope that you find it useful. Of course, I'm not the only one, not the first one and definitely not the best one who gives such introductory talks about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but still I hope you find my perspective interesting and useful. So let's start. I would like to start with two quotes from two very well-known and respected people in this space. The first one is Mark Andreessen, who is nowadays mostly known as an investor, but he also played a very important role in the early days of the World Wide Web, and he, for instance, developed the first web browser with a graphical interface. He said that Bitcoin is a breakthrough in computer science, one that builds on 40 years of research in cryptography by thousands of researchers. I can totally agree with that, and Bitcoin is a brilliant example of how different parts, different cryptographic primitives, some of uh, which have been developed long ago, in the 80s or maybe even in the 70s, are combined together in this very clever way and obtain new new properties from the way they are combined. And the second quote is from the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. If you don't believe me or don't get it, I don't have the time to try to convince you. Sorry. First of all, to understand what, what is the problem that we are trying to solve with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, we have to think about what actually money is. So money is something that has three main properties and serves three main functions, namely being a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and a store of value. And contrary to uh, popular misconceptions, uh, no currency currently is backed by anything. Like people are often saying that something is backed by gold or backed by government or backed by, I don't know, an economy of the country. But all these phrases actually are meaningless because nobody guarantees you that you can uh, take a $10 bill or 10 euro bill or whatever and turn it into something. I mean, you don't have an absolute right to do so. People are just willing to trade with you because they believe this piece of paper or this coin or these digits in an electronic account will be worth something in a foreseeable future and they will be able to buy some valuable goods and services using this currency. So actually money is something that functions as money and as long as people believe that something is money, then that is money. The current monetary system, also known in the cryptocurrency space as fiat money, or money issued by government, has many drawbacks. It is centralized, and issuance of currencies are usually managed by central banks of the respective countries. Uh, the transparency of this process is pretty low, and the emission is unpredictable. Of course, some countries manage emission better than the others, some currencies are more stable than the others, but still we cannot predict mathematically, we cannot prove that tomorrow a substantial amount of US dollars or some other currency will be just created out of thin air. That is why we have systematic inflation, usually in fiat currencies. All these monetary systems and all the financial services are surrounded by layers and layers of bureaucracy, and there is too much regulation. It's actually pretty difficult to innovate in this space because you cannot just create your own bank and start issuing debit cards or credit cards or whatever. You have to comply with lots of complex regulation. And you have to get an approval. You have to get a permission. You can just do it. And what's most, most importantly probably is that all these technologies that we are currently using in fiat money were just not created for the internet. These technologies, our banking cards, are not natively digital. They were created some 50 or 60 years ago when no internet was even in sight and uh, only later with some layers of information technologies they were turned into something that we actually can use to shop online but from a technological perspective honestly this architecture is pretty ugly so our goal is to try to create decentralized digital money if we manage to create such money uh, that means that the rules will be, will be transparent and open to every participant. Everyone will be able to understand why the system functions the way it does. It is not controlled by any organization and no one can exercise full power and full control over the system. And what's more, more important and perhaps most important, you don't have to trust anyone 
or any single organization or any single person to use the system. So this is actually what Bitcoin implemented and we're going to see how it did it. A useful analogy, in my opinion, is the analogy of file sharing. So you might have heard of the BitTorrent protocol, but before BitTorrent there were other file sharing networks, for instance Napster. It was the pioneer of peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing. It appeared in 1999 and gained popularity very quickly, but it was shut down in a couple of years because of the copyright law enforcement. The reason why the law enforcement was able to shut down the service um, was that the service was actually centralized. The peer-to-peer -peer exchange of files was decentralized, and it is true that the peers were transferring files between each other, but they were coordinated by a single authority. There was a single server which kept track of who had which files and who wanted to download which files. And it was sufficient to close the server and all the system went down. But then, in the same year when Napster was shut down, the BitTorrent protocol appeared. And it was different from previous file sharing protocols because it was fully decentralized. Of course, you could create a website known as a torrent tracker and just create a catalog of torrent files but the protocol does not require it. You can just handle torrent files privately by email or on some closed uh, web forum or just any anything. The file sharing itself does not require you to coordinate your actions with any central authority. That is why the BitTorrent protocol, despite multiple attempts from law enforcement and again this copyright uh, claims and so on and so on, nobody was able to shut down this protocol completely. Of course, in the latest year, years, it's not so popular as it used to be in early 2000s due to the rise of streaming services and video sharing, video streaming and audio streaming. But nevertheless, the protocol itself couldn't be shut down. The same thing with money. There was this interesting project called, Li called Liberty Reserve, uh, which provided some ways to exchange digital currency and uh, did not pay that much attention to the anti-money laundering requirements and know your customer requirements, and it was eventually shut down by the American authorities. But then Bitcoin appeared in the year 2009, and just like BitTorrent, it's not a service, but it's a protocol. It's just a set of rules that computers can follow and implement some functionality. It doesn't require any coordination with any central authority. That's why it is technically impossible to completely shut down Bitcoin. A popular question about Bitcoin is who created it. The creator of Bitcoin is known uh, under the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. We actually don't know who this person is. We only know Satoshi Nakamoto from, um, from posts on forums and uh, emails. We may deduct some assumptions uh, from the available information that we have, but still, it is actually not so important. Satoshi Nakamoto disappeared in 2011. He left the last message saying that he was going to move from Bitcoin, move on to another more interesting projects. And I'd be very interested to see which projects he considers more interesting than Bitcoin. But nevertheless, uh, the only appearance afterwards in the online space was in 2014, when Satoshi Nakamoto um, disproved the investigation by Newsweek. Newsweek claimed to have found the creator of Bitcoin, but it turned out that this guy was not actually Satoshi. But from the point of view of technology, from the point of view of the protocol, it is not even so important to know who Satoshi is. So now let's start discussing the Bitcoin itself, how it works. Why do we need a bank at all? Actually, the main purpose of the bank is to maintain the ledger, maintain the information about who owns how much money. How can we maintain the ledger in a distributed, decentralized way without having to trust any central authority? The major challenges are how to update it, who makes these updates, and if two entities make conflicting updates, how do we resolve this conflict? Or another way to um, pose the same question is how to keep the records in sync. Okay, so we will start with an easier problem. The easier problem, uh, the easier challenge is how to uh, not allow people spend each other's money. So this is so this is easily solved with a well-known and well-tested cryptographic primitive called digital signature. Each user has a pair of keys, which are just mathematically related numbers with the following properties. You can derive the public key from the private key, but it is very, very hard to do it the other way. And you can create what is called a digital signature, which is a piece of data that can prove that you really own the private key required to create this signature. 
but the only thing that is required to prove that you did that is your public key. So every transaction in Bitcoin is digitally signed and in that way everybody can make sure that uh, the one who is trying to spend the money actually has the money they are trying to spend. It is very hard to forge a digital signature, but it is very easy to verify provided with a public key. But the key problem and the key challenge which prevented the humanity from creating fully decentralized digital money for about 20 years uh, was the so-called double spending problem. How do we prevent people from spending their money twice? If we have some kind of digital coin, some kind of some piece of information that denotes some value, if I send it to two different destinations, how do we um, choose which of the two transactions is valid and uh, which one is invalid? The first answer that comes to mind is, okay, the first one obviously will be valid and all subsequent transactions that try to spend the same money will be invalid, obviously. But the problem is that in a decentralized network, it is very hard to maintain the notion of time uh, because messages are propagating through the network unpredictably they can be delayed, they can be dropped, and the malicious actors can forge timestamps and we can't just trust the timestamps that someone is creating. That's actually the key challenge. And later we'll see how Bitcoin solved this challenge in a very clever way. The ledger of Bitcoin stores transactions instead of balances. It doesn't store the balances themselves, uh, but your balance is calculated based on the transactions that transfer Bitcoins to your address. Every transaction is checked for correctness by every participant and you can track the origin of every Bitcoin up to the creation, which we will discuss a little bit later. Transactions are combined into blocks and blocks are chained together in a chain of blocks or the blockchain. Blocks are ordered chronologically, that means that all transactions in block number 100, for example, are guaranteed to happen later than all transactions in block number 99. The nodes of the network are trying to extend the blockchain. They're trying to combine the latest yet unconfirmed transactions into a block and append this block to the latest block currently on the blockchain. But you cannot just append the block to the blockchain. You have to solve a puzzle. So in order to understand what this puzzle is, we have to understand what a cryptographic hash function is. A cryptographic hash function takes any data of any length as input and produces a fixed length output. The main property of hash function is that for different data we get different values. It is not invertible. You cannot say anything about the input just looking at the output. And it is completely unpredictable. The only way you can say something about the value of uh, the hash of some data is just to calculate this hash and just see. Now, a good cryptographic hash function acts like a random number generator. So, for instance, you can see the address of my personal homepage and the value of SHA-256 hash function is this first long line of characters. But if I just add one character to my string, namely the uh, dot at the end, the hash looks completely different and completely unpredictable. Okay, so what is that puzzle that Bitcoin nodes are trying to solve in order to extend the blockchain? So if we denote the H being the cryptographic hash function, so H index zero is the hash of the latest block and the H1 to HN are the IDs of new transactions. Actually, this construction in Bitcoin, in actual Bitcoin, it's a bit more complex. It involves something that's called a Merkle tree, but for the sake of simplicity, I omit this construction here. And we have uh, some number T, which is called a target. It is network-wide constant for a given moment. So everybody on the network is aware what T is. It changes from time to time, but it's not important for this slide. And n is some random number. We can just plug any number we want into this n variable. And our goal, our puzzle is to come up with the random number n such that if we hash everything together, together, if we hash the hash of the previous block, all the transactions, and this random number, we get some value so that it is less than the target. So think about it. The hash acts basically like a random function. And here we set some threshold and we're trying to make the result of the hash function be less than this target. We can only solve this puzzle by trying different values of n. The only way to solve this is brute force search. So we just try different n, n equals zero, doesn't pass, n equal one, no, n equal two, no. 
and so on and so on. And then we stumble upon N392. And then just randomly, we get the number, the, we get the hash less than the target. That means that we have solved this problem and our block with this small hash can be attached to the latest block in the chain. The question is, how do we choose the right chain? So imagine that two different nodes produce two different solutions for the puzzle approximately at the same time. So the network has to choose the one branch that will be the only true branch. The rule in Bitcoin is the longest branch, not just the longest in terms of blocks, but actually the longest in terms of most computing power invested in this particular branch. So based on this uh, target, we can calculate or we can approximate, at least statistically, the amount of work, the amount of computing power required to produce any block. And consequently, we can calculate the weight of every chain, the weight being the, the total estimate of the work required to produce this chain. And the network considers the longest chain valid, the chain with the most work behind it. So this is something like voting for the legitimate chain, where one CPU equals one vote. Of course, nowadays it's not so simple, but I will get to the details a little bit later. You may ask, can I forge the blockchain? Can I create some fake transactions or do something nasty? So what is actually forge the blockchain? What does it mean? It means that you are trying to convince the majority of the network that your version of history is valid. You cannot just change some transaction in the middle of the block, like 20 blocks away, because the chain is constantly validated. Each transaction is included in a block and the blocks are chained. If you change just a single bit in any transaction in any point in history of the blockchain, that means that all the hashes of the blocks up until now will change randomly and your new version of history will be considered invalid. The network will just ignore the falsified chain and continue with the longest chain. Okay, you may come up with a clever plan, which is the following. You buy something for Bitcoin, uh, you wait until you get the good you're buying, and then you create a new transaction, which spends the same money, but to another address, to your address, in fact. So you're trying to get the good and the money at the same time. You produce the blocks that confirm your version of history, and you publish this alternative chain. And if you are lucky enough to convince the network that your chain is correct, that means that you have successfully performed this attack and you have the good and you have the money at the same time. Actually, in order to perform such attack, you have to control more than a half of the total computing power of Bitcoin. This attack is known as 51% attack and the goal of the attacker here is to uh, outpace the network and make all the network believe that this chain is actually valid. The Bitcoin white paper provides some statistical calculations that prove that if the attacker has less than half of the total computing power, then the probability of, of him being able to convince the network that his chain is correct decreases exponentially depending on the number of blocks that have been produced since the transaction in question. This is where a well-known six blocks rule comes from. If you wait for just one block, one confirmation of your transaction, that still means that with some non-negligible probability, your transaction can be reverted for some weird reason. But if you wait for six blocks, it's basically guaranteed to never be reverted. So the more blocks you wait, the less the probability that something can go wrong with your transactions. Assuming, of course, that an attacker controls less than half of the network computing power. Now we come to the question of the network difficulty. So you remember that parameter T, the target, that we're trying to make the hash be less than the target. This difficulty parameter actually changes dynamically every 12 days. It is auto-adjusted in Bitcoin so that the blocks are generated on average every 10 minutes. So the goal of this difficulty parameter is to maintain the more or less stable pace at which new blocks are generated. And you will understand very soon why this is so important. So on this graph right here, you see the difficulty chart, but not of Bitcoin, but of Litecoin, which is another cryptocurrency. It is a graph from 2013, 2014. It's pretty, pretty old, but you get the idea. Uh, if during the previous period of 12 days, on average, it took less than 10 minutes to produce a block, that means that the difficulty is low. It should be higher. 
and it adjusts so that the blocks will be produced on average every 10 minutes. So this situation is happening if new miners, new, new members are joining the network, are trying to produce new blocks and competing for, for this. If, on the other hand, users are leaving the network, there are less nodes, less miners, I will define what a miner is, by the way, in the next slide. That means that the difficulty will drop and it will be easier to produce new blocks. So one question remains, where do new bitcoins come from? Actually, the process of generating new blocks is called mining and the user who manages to produce the next block is automatically rewarded by newly minted bitcoins. It means on a technical level that if you're trying to produce a block, you can create this block with a special transaction which is called a coinbase transaction which creates bitcoins out of nowhere and you can assign your own address so that these new bitcoins will be assigned to you of course you can assign them to whoever you want but usually it is your address when bitcoin launched in 2009 the reward for a block was 50 bitcoins and due to the algorithm encoded in bitcoin's source code the block reward halves every approximately four years so the latest halving was in july 2016 and the next one is expected in 2020. And here we see on the graph this diminishing rate at which new Bitcoins are being generated. And the maximum amount of Bitcoin that will ever exist is 21 million. And the last Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140. But of course, um, earlier than that, even in maybe 2040 or something, the amount of Bitcoins that are minted as block reward will be already very, very small. So this mechanism of emission guarantees us, first of all, a fair initial distribution of money. So uh, consider this, the more computing power you have, the um, more hashes you can try per unit of time to try to hit the target. That means that you contribute the most to the overall security of the network, because for an adversary, it becomes very hard to produce blocks faster than you. That means that you are rewarded, again, on average, probabilistically, more than other participants. So this is this circular argument, the more you do for the network, the more the network rewards you, and on the other hand, the more secure the network is, the more your reward is actually worth. So this is this positive feedback loop that helped Bitcoin to be bootstrapped from basically nothing, from having the price of zero to the price of, at the time I'm recording this uh, screencast, about $15,000. Bitcoin is deflationary currency and systematic inflation is not possible because it is not possible to create Bitcoins just out of thin air. Bitcoins are generated on a very predictable scale and you can say with certainty how many Bitcoins there will be in existence 10 years from now, 20 years from now, even 100 years from now, which is absolutely un unimaginable for any fiat currency. And the emission algorithm, as well as all other parameters of the network, are well, well known to all players. So Anyone who wants to participate in this ecosystem, who wants to invest money in mining, in Bitcoin development or something, anyone with some technical skills can look at the source code, can read the documentation and can make sure that this system actually does what it is supposed to do. Contrary to, again, fiat system when you have basically no idea how decisions are made on a higher level in the central bank, in big banks and so on. Speaking of mining, uh, actually, Satoshi Nakamoto, as far as we can tell, did not foresee this hardware specialization that occurred. So he envisioned Bitcoin being mined on just regular computers, regular um, CPUs, and uh, one, one CPU being one vote. But about 2011, I suppose, people figured out that if you have a graphics card, uh, you can parallelize the hashing and it becomes much more efficient. And for a couple of years, Bitcoins were mined bas basically mainly on graphical processing units, then this weird programmable specialized devices appeared, FPGAs, but um, shortly after that, I think in 2013-2014, the ultra-specialized devices, application-specific integrated circuits or ASIC appeared, and uh, they are only suited for one task. They are only good for calculating SHA-256 hash. They are massively produced by specialized factories, mainly in China, I suppose, and regular users cannot compete with these devices on regular hardware. So mining used to look like this. You have four, six, eight, or however many you can fit um, GPUs attached to one motherboard, usually in this open, open case, 
without, without the case actually for better cooling because all this uh, device produces a significant amount of heat and um, requires a significant amount of electricity and you even have this um, this fan that helps cool down this device. Uh, this is what mining used to look like in the year I suppose 2011, 2012, maybe 2013 but since then mining is basically very specialized, very large-scale enterprise grade data centers with professional equipment. Apart from Bitcoin, there exists many alternative cryptocurrencies or altcoins. Bitcoin is free and open source and everybody can fork Bitcoin's code and create a new cryptocurrency. And of course, anyone can also create a new cryptocurrency by implementing it from scratch, but borrowing some ideas from Bitcoin, for instance, the proof of work mechanism. So there is, for example, Litecoin, which is basically the same as Bitcoin, but with faster block and another hash function used for proof of work. There is Namecoin, there is Peercoin and all these other coins. Some of them are more interesting than others. Okay, summing up, what advantages do we have when we have Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Uh, we have the natively digital money and I think that's very very important for the digital age when we have internet basically everywhere affecting all aspects of our lives. Now we have the unit of account and medium of exchange and store of value that is native to this digital environment. It is basically the currency of the internet. It enables us to do fast cross-border payments without restrictions you don't have to pay 20% fee for Western Union or other companies that do remittances or banks that close on weekends, which is just ridiculous in the digital age. But you can just transfer bitcoins anytime, any amount you want. You can create accounts without identity. You don't have to show your ID, your passport or anything. You just download the software, you click a button and you have an account. As simple as that. Nobody can freeze your account and nobody can reverse transactions if they happen and if they get confirmed by, say, six blocks after they happen. In the earlier version of this presentation, I had this other bullet points, for instance, low fees and micropayments, but now fees are actually so high due to the increased demands, uh, you now have to pay dollars, maybe five dollars, maybe even ten dollars to do a transaction, and of course it's not suitable for micropayments, mm, but I hope this will change in the near future with some other more sophisticated scaling techniques. So what's next for Bitcoin? The most important issue is, of course, scaling, because the demand is very high and the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, cannot accommodate all the transactions that um, users, that people all over the world want to make. So they have to pay high fees. And some of the solutions include, for instance, payment channels or side chains or some other techniques that would let us perform most of our transactions off the blockchain, but still with the guarantee that if something goes wrong, that if some party will try to cheat, another party will be able to enforce the agreement by, by a usual uh, Bitcoin transaction. That is very interesting uh, area of research in my opinion, but we don't yet have a working payment channel network on any major blockchain, but uh, the research and the development is ongoing right now. There is also a privacy problem because all Bitcoin transactions are broadcast in plain text. Everybody can see how much money each account has. And uh, despite the fact that accounts are not connected to any identity, if I obtain the, uh, the, the this connection from other third sources, from, I don't know, some um, exchange uh, database or some other leakage, that means that I will be able to track some other person's financial flows on the blockchain. And there are alternative blockchains, for instance, there is Zcash cryptocurrency, there are others, for instance, Monero and Dash, which use sophisticated cryptography to provide privacy. Of course, uh, apart from that, we have the UI slash UX problem for people uh, who are not so familiar with technologies. It might be very hard to understand the mechanics behind Bitcoin and the wallets are not so user-friendly yet as they probably should be though progress is being made. Um, there is also the problem of exchanges. If you want to buy or sell cryptocurrency, if you want to exchange uh, one cryptocurrency for another, you have to usually register uh, with an exchange and you have to trust them basically not to run away with your money or not to get hacked so the hackers can run away with your money. And technically, it should be possible to implement totally decentralized exchanges that would operate on the blockchain so that you could atomically swap some amount of cryptocurrency A for some amount of cryptocurrency B. 
but uh, still we don't have a working solution. Uh, and some other directions such as digitally controlled property, integration with cell phone networks and so on and so forth. Basically when we have digital programmable money, uh, the opportunities are endless. Of course I must dedicate a separate slide to the open blockchain number two, namely Ethereum. It is a smart contract blockchain. It was designed and proposed by Vitalik Buterin and uh, they did a, uh, the uh, fifth biggest crowdfunding at the time, raised about 18 million dollars in 2014. So their idea is to create a blockchain with a Turing complete virtual machine so that people could write smart contracts and implement just arbitrary functionality that would be executed on the blockchain exactly as it is programmed, completely trustlessly. So there is this code that lives on the blockchain and you don't have to trust anyone to run your code. The, the, the miners actually, the nodes run your code and they can only execute the code as you wrote it. Ethereum launched in 2015 and uh, as of uh, late 2017 by basically all relevant metrics it is the blockchain number two after Bitcoin by market capitalization, by difficulty of mining, by just general interest. This is a very exciting development and I'm also doing research partially in this area. So to summarize, why is it even possible? What made Bitcoin possible? First of all, as I mentioned uh, on one of the previous slides, it's years and years or even uh, decades of researching cryptography and distributed systems. Uh, but also it's important then um, after Bitcoin was created, uh, it was created from day one as an open protocol and as free software. It's free and open source. That means that anyone can look at the code, can modify the code, can propose some changes. And uh, this ecosystem that emerged, this blockchain, blockchain uh, space, so to say, provides many new possibilities. It is very easy to join. You have to just download some software, learn to code smart contracts or learn to program some blockchain facing applications. You don't have to get anyone's permission. You can just start right away. Bitcoin is a platform for innovation. And I should maybe say even in, in broader terms, blockchains are platforms for innovation, just like the internet. So I encourage you to pick some blockchain that you like, be that Bitcoin, Ethereum or some other blockchain, study it and maybe join the community, propose your ideas or implement some exciting new project using these new technologies. So here is the last slide and if you are interested in uh, my research, in what I do, feel free to visit my personal homepage. You will find links to my academic papers, to my talks at conferences, to a podcast that I host. If you're a Russian speaker, I host a podcast about blockchain in Russian and some other links to my social media accounts when you, where you can uh, get in touch with me. So I hope this talk was interesting and uh, useful. If you are a newcomer to the Bitcoin slash blockchain space, welcome. I encourage you to learn more and uh, good luck with exploring this exciting and uh, fascinating field. Bye-bye.